And uh, we left off with uh, one of the proponents was uh, Mr. Barone, and he is called in this morning and said he would, could not make it for this meeting. And so is there a Kelly Ripple here, any chance? Okay. And he was in, we were informed that you would be uh, offering testimony as a proponent. Deal. So welcome to the committee. Thank you very much, um, Chairman Kirshen and, and committee members. I really just wanted to um, provide a, a couple points that Kevin wanted to make yesterday and then um, let the other uh, people testify. So um, as Kevin mentioned yesterday, there is quite a bit of confusion just around um, the jurisdiction around what is considered processing seed and fiber is going to be a major player moving forward. So we just want to make sure that all of the components of the of the expanded commercial program uh, are included in in the oversight of this. Um, the main point is that there were some national emergency alerts that were sent out specifically about this bill. But that's kind of where some of the confusion was. It isn't really about this bill. This bill is important because, uh, as you all had mentioned yesterday, um, this was originally done through a, uh, a budget uh, proviso. I mean, it wasn't done in statute. So this is important so that this jurisdiction is under the fire marshal. It's m mostly the rules and regulations that just need to be worked through now um, admit it, administratively. So that's, that's our understanding. Um, and so at this time, I, I will yield my time. I'll um, be open for questions as I, I do currently stand on the Industrial Hemp Advisory Board with um, the Kansas Department of Agriculture. And uh, we will be meeting tomorrow about specifically the USDA uh, final hemp rule. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Hang on, then, Kelly. Um, I know it was short notice, but uh, I would ask you to put your uh, a written testimony of some kind with your sure. name on and your information so that we had it for the record. Absolutely, yes. Give that to Judy here at okay. some point. So we'll do. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Yes. So do we have an opportunity for questions? Yes, you do. <laughs> Kelly, you got some questions ready. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, you referenced rules and regs, and that's one of the reasons that um, we're working on this bill. So right now they're um, operating under temporary um, regulations. Yes, as, as stated uh, by Farm Marshal Jorgensen yesterday, correct? Okay. So, um, and I understand that they say that they're working on those and they um, have a, a timeline, um, but it would, would it be important to you to <clears throat> get those rules and regulations adopted as permanent rules and regs? As, as they stand right now? Um, they may need to be changed, right? No, but to, to get rules and regs adopted permanently, is that important to you? Y yes, yes. Uh, some, some form of rules and regulations is important for, for processing in the state, yes. Thank you. Any other questions for Kelly? Seeing none, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, next up uh, as a proponent, we have Colby Turlip, he's virtual. Colby, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes. I'm here. Hi, everyone. Okay. Welcome, welcome to the committee. Yeah. Thank you for your time. So my name is Colby Turlip. Um, I'm the owner of Sunflower Hemp Co. in Pittsburgh, Kansas. So we're a CBD post processor. So I'm here in support of HB 2244. Uh, my major concerns are with the Article 26 rules and regs of the fire marshal. So a little, little bit about Sunflower first uh, before we get to the nuts and bolts here. Uh, Sunflower is a post-processor, so we're buying CBD crude oil and then refining that into an ingredient that will go into your consumer products. Um, Sunflower Hemp Company has invested well over a, a million dollars in uh, real estate training, research, all to do business in Kansas. We have a payroll of about $300,000 annually. Um, so we think that uh, we need to adopt rules and regs that will allow a processor to continue to do business successfully, and we think some of the Article 26 rules and regs are taking away our opportunity to, to, to run a successful business. So one of my major concerns is with uh, 222614. Um, that is the transportation um, of extracts. So a little bit about how transactions take place in the hemp world. So most of the hemp being grown in Kansas, I believe, is for CBD, for extracts. 
Um, so you have your farmer. Your farmer will take his biomass to an extractor slash processor. Um, then that processor will either manufacture a consumer product or pass that extract along to a co-packer or manufacturer of a consumer product. And then you have your end user. So the, the way that the business transactions are taking place in the economy of hemp, the farmer, unless he has his biomass contracted out to a processor, he is not just selling his biomass outright because they can't make any money that way. So the farmer is tied to their extract until the extract gets sold. So it's not a traditional uh, economy like uh, wheat or corn where you can take your corn down and <clears throat> get it sold on the open market and make some money. The farmer needs to sell the extract. That's where he's going to make his money at the moment. So hopefully that will change in the future where a farmer can just sell their biomass and make money, but that's not the way um, transactions are taking place at the moment. So 22, 26, 14 doesn't allow for the an extract above 0.3% THC to leave a processing facility. So the only way for a processor for to sell that extract would be to mix it with something to get the THC below 0.3%. I am unaware we could mix it with anything that would that we could actually get out of it, but it had to be a solvent such as ethanol. So usually a hemp extract, a raw crude extract that you extract from biomass is around two to three percent THC. So you're looking at a 10 to one ratio of a mixture. So you were you have one five gallon bucket, now you have 10 five gallon buckets. So on an economy of scale, an extractor like Keith, who would testify after me, he has he will have I don't know, many to hundreds of five gallon buckets of crude oil that he would need tanker trucks full of ethanol to try to mix with his crude oil just to get it out the door. And also when you mix your raw extract with any sort of substance, you can't, it, it makes it unmarketable. Nobody wants to buy that extract. So it puts us in a position and the farmer in a position because he has to sell his extract that he, he needs to take that extract to another state. If I was farming, I would take my, my biomass to another state where they don't have to mix their extracts uh, to sell it because if you take it to a processor in Kansas for us to get it out the door, it's going to make it unmarketable because we have to mix it with a solvent. So I just think that Kansas needs to come up with a simple solution. Like Kentucky has a one page form uh, they can fill out to move hemp extracts between licensed processors um, with 24 hours notice. And we don't have to go through all the stipulations in 22, 26, 14 such as uh, putting a padlock on a vehicle. We would have to get a special vehicle that we could padlock. We had to put tamper evidence seals on all of our containers. Uh, we had to put a metal, metal uh, strip on the outside like you see on a semi-trailer to make sure it wasn't tampered. We have to take uh, photos of the extract before it was loaded and after it was loaded. Um, I understand some oversight is necessary and I am not against oversight. I think we need oversight. I just think this is going above and beyond what is necessary and what will allow hemp processors and even farmers in this state to be successful. So even in moving product between processors, so Kansas right now, as I understand, you can't sell a consumer product that supposedly has any THC in it. So Heath, who is another processor, he, he doesn't do THC remediation. I perform THC remediation here. So in order for him to get his product to me, to make it legal to get it into a consumer product, he would have to mix that with ethanol to bring it to me. Now we would have to mix, you know, many, many, many gallons of ethanol into that extract to get it to me. And I don't want to deal with the ethanol. I don't have the capabilities to deal with all that ethanol. So under this, under this rule and rake, he can't even properly get his extract to me for me to take the THC out of it so he can make that into a product he can sell in Kansas. Excuse me. <coughs> It also doesn't, and speaking with the fire marshal, we, we talked in our meeting that we, um, we need to send samples for testing here. So we need to send samples to a third party lab to have a potency testing to tell us how much CBD, how much THC is in our products. So 22, 26, 14 doesn't even allow us to send out um, small, like five, three, four, five gram samples um, of our extracts to a third party testing lab to actually let us know what's in there so we can successfully run our business and treat those extracts you know, further down the process like they need to be treated. Um, so 
I have a couple other. Well, let's talk about before we get into those. Let's talk about the. So a couple years ago, HB twenty one sixty seven. I don't know if you guys have a copy of that. Kevin was supposed. To, Barone was supposed to maybe get that to you guys, but uh, HB twenty one sixty seven. Um, I'm no lawyer. I'm, I don't interpret the law, but it says that this bill includes industrial hemp as an exception to the definition of marijuana and the definition sections of and crimes involving controlled substances. This bill also excludes from a schedule on controlled substance list any THC in industrial hemp as defined by the act and hemp products as defined by the act, unless otherwise considered unlawful. So Mr. Jorgensen was saying that there's a law or a regulation somewhere that would have to be changed before he could change his 222614 um, uh, to allow for extracts to be transported between licensed processors that were above 0.3. So I don't I would like to know where this HB 2120 2167 would fall into allowing us to transport those extracts that are above 0.3 because it seems to me this reads that this we're treating that THC like a controlled substance but this effectively removed the THC and industrial hemp and hemp products from the controlled substance list. Um, two more th things, 22-26-11 requires us to do an extensive inventory report um, and report, report that to the fire marshal every day. Um, it wants to know locations of all of our products and all of the products that he has defined in the regulations such as finished products, waste, byproducts, intermediate products. It wants to know the, the weights, the locations of these. And in the hemp processing world, there are many different intricacies of processing. And it's, this will be really hard to conform to. Um, I think it can't probably can be done, but I think something much simpler and streamlined could be uh, proposed that would have the same effect as what they're trying to do here, which I think is trying to figure out how much CBD and THC and hemp is going in and out of a processing facility, which I understand why, but I think this kind of is very, very too, too detailed for us to handle on, on, a, on a basis that we can you know, properly fill this out accurately. Um, also, 22-26-9 requires us to have 90 days of uh, video surveillance recorded. Um, I have a video surveillance system in my facility uh, we have seven or eight cameras here. I was, it's going to cost a few thousand bucks. I called my IT guy, my technology guy, and it'll cost a few thousand dollars for me to install some kind of DVR in here that will record uh, and keep 90 days of 24 seven live video. So uh, maybe we, you know, talk about reducing that to 30 days um, or something like that. But there's just some, some added expenses uh, to the, the fire marshal's rules and regs. Um, and that are going to make it hard for us to do business and incur, incur a lot of costs. So the, the way the regulations are written, it's going to either a, a, a processor has to, is, are, is going to have to extract biomass and he's going to have to be involved, integrated all the way down to making a consumer product. So there are many different business models if we didn't have the, the the way 22 26 14 is written there are many different business models that could play out in the hemp processing space but this is essentially allowing only for one model so we need to look at this so we can run a successful business as a processor and even like i said the farmers are tied to their extract at the moment and that's how they make money so the farmers need to be able to make money and by proposing the 22 26 14 you're not going to allow the farmer to sell his extract in Kansas. If he takes it across state lines, he will probably be okay. So thank you for your time. Okay, <clears throat> thank you Heath uh, for those uh, comments. And I'll ask if there's any questions from the committee. Any questions? I would say, would say first of all, you've, you've, you've listed several things that, that you consider very important requirements. And you are a proponent of this bill though, aren't you? Yes, yes I am. Yes. You're, so you're just saying just, you want some need to work out some of these ideas you just talked about. We need to work out, yes, mainly 22, 26, 14, or we're not going to be able to do business successfully. And farmers who are growing CBD hemp will not be able to, to farm successfully. Because okay. they're, they're not making their money off the biomass. They're making 
their money off the extract. And the way it's written, we cannot sell the extract because we can't move it. All right. Any other committee have any? Senator Francisco has a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you referred to uh, Bill. Can you just uh, give me that number again? That, yeah. Uh, that, uh, HB 2167. It's from a couple years ago. You're talking about the control substance? Yes. One, yeah. yeah. Luckily, we have a library and they can find it. Okay. okay. All right. <clears throat> any other questions for Mr. <clears throat> thank you very much. And uh, our, our next proponent is uh, Virtual 2. Heath Martin from Kansas, Cana. Virtual. Heath, can you hear us? Uh, yes, we can. Can you guys hear me? We hear you now. We can't see you yet, but uh, I imagine you're coming. So, I welcome started to, the video. Welcome to the committee, Heath. Okay. Uh, yeah, committee. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for your willingness to hear us out. Uh, um, basically, I'm going to match and mirror what uh, what Colby has already said. <clears throat> I think. Uh, you know, just, just to get started, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about Can Canna. Um, I've spent the last 10 years before this facility in uh, ag technology. I, I work for one of the largest Case IH dealer groups in the state. And um, our desire to actually build this processing facility came from the, uh, the conversations that I'd had with multiple farmers across the state of Kansas. And uh, they all wanted to grow hemp. They all saw the uh, benefit to the industry. And frankly, nobody knew where they were going to take it. Um, so for myself, who has a technology background and my business partner, um, it seemed like a logical idea to, to essentially give the farmers an opportunity to have an in-state processor that they could do business with um, and rely on. So um, we have uh, we've been in business since 2019. Um, we were one of the first processors to get our license. Uh, we've had absolutely no violations since then. Um, we are a CO2 processor, um, and and things have been going relatively smoothly um, under the direction of the KDA. Uh, we've made significant investment in in real estate, construction, and equipment. Um, we're north of seven million dollars um, invested into this uh, this industry, and uh, like I said, we've had we've had no issues thus far. We we employ seven full time people, um, seven full time guys, and um, looking to add more and looking to grow, but some of the uh, proposed rules and regs are, are gonna make that impossible uh, to do in this state. Um, so, you know, we're looking at this and, and I'll match kind of what Colby said, the transportation without dilution um, is, is absolutely key for us. Um, you know, we're in Kansas and our farms are big and our farmers are good. And, and we tried to, uh, to build our processing facility um, to, to scale that and, we produce enough extract that if we had to dilute it before transporting it, we would literally need semi tankers full of ethanol because the dilution rate is, is so high. Not to mention that once we dilute it, it's virtually unsellable. Um, nobody wants a pre-diluted product because everybody in their consumer packaged goods has their own recipe or has their own formulation. They want to blend it with a certain flavor or a certain carrier oil or, or those things to get them into consumer packed goods. If we've already done the blending, it's, it's worthless to them. Um, you know, we, we are not criminals. We have, none of us have been in trouble. We've all submitted ourselves to the KBI background check and we've paid our processing fees. So I feel like we should have the ability to handle this stuff responsibly. Um, the last thing we want to do is violate any laws because we know that that would take away our licensing and, and obviously shut down our business. <clears throat> the, the second thing that uh, is going to make what we do much more difficult than it already is, um, is daily inventory reporting. Um, as, as Colby alluded, our process is to get from a biomass that the farmer delivers to us to an end product that we can either sell or move on down the line to a remediation facility like Colby's takes multiple days in multiple stages. Um, people would understand that and know that um, had they come and visited. I've, I've invited, I've asked, uh, we've been an open book through this whole process um, and, and I'm, we're always happy to educate. 
Um, but that's going to be very difficult because it takes multiple days and there are multiple stages at which this oil and or byproduct goes through. Um, there's also another rule in here. I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't as prepared as Colby was uh, to give you the actual article number. Um, but it states in these rules and regs that we must devitalize all seeds that come into our facility within 10 days. Um, I could understand that for marijuana. I could not understand that at all for hemp. Hemp seeds have a food value. Um, they're actually very, very good for you. Um, and also, the is not going to be able to be taken out um, and used to grow any plant that, you know, it's never going to leave our facility. We will divide, devitalize it eventually. But to, to devitalize a whole farmer's crop that may be upwards of 50 to 100,000 pounds that we receive in, in 10 days just is not at all feasible um we we just don't have that that capacity right now um we need to do it over over several weeks or several months um i will kind of end with this um you know cbd is currently roughly a 14 billion dollar industry you can find uh you know greater greater estimations out there it's expected to be over a 20 billion dollar market um by 2025 Here's the problem I see with this. We're in Kansas. We have, we have the greatest farmers in the world. We have a huge land mass. We can do this. Our climate is perfect for hemp and, and our farmers are adapting well um, to, to this new market and to growing this new crop to them. But if there's nowhere to process it, there's nowhere to take it and the places that can take it can't sell it, this essentially kills this industry in the state. And if that's the case, uh, I hate to do this because I'm a Kansas boy born and raised. I'm, I'm gonna be forced to do nothing more than put my facility on the same trucks that they rolled in here on and, and move it to another state that's more friendly because we've got too much invested and we believe too much in this industry um, to stop now. Thank you guys. Right, uh, thank you very much, Heath. Uh, committee, any questions for um, uh, Senator Ware? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Heath. Good to see you again. Yeah, you, was, you too, Senator. <laughs> yeah, I guess I had on a mask the other day when I was visiting your facility. You did. Uh, and, and I have to say, uh, I learned a lot, but there's probably, there's loads more that I could have absorbed while I was there. Can you explain in just a little bit more detail how the, how the daily reporting just doesn't quite fit? It seems like it should, but it doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our process is broken up into um, essentially four different rooms or four different segments. And initially the biomass is gonna come in from the grower. First step is grinding. So in a day, I'm going to take biomass from a grower and, and grind it into a, a basically a fine powder that we're gonna use to extract. Um, and, and that process will happen in a day. We roughly grind 1,000 to 1,200 pounds. So ground material, day one, um, they're gonna want an inventory report for that. Um, sometimes we work till five, sometimes we work till seven. Um, sometimes it, it's just all over the board. So next step would be actually um, a decarboxylation process, which is just a fancy way of saying we, we bake the hemp to a certain temperature. Um, so they're gonna want how many pounds we've sent through that process in a day. Well, also, that that varies drastically and, and there's different constraints on that as well. Third step would be actual extraction. And this is where things are gonna get really tricky and very confusing to people that don't understand the hemp industry because we are then going to take that thousand pounds of hemp biomass and we are going to extract that into a crude oil. So we're gonna take roughly a thousand pounds of hemp and we may get 15 kilos or 15 liters of crude oil, um, depending on the quality of hemp that we have, or we may get 65 or 75 liters of crude oil, depending on the quality of, of um, hemp biomass that we have. Um, and I'll, I'll circle back to that in just a second. But then it goes into a finishing lab. 
So each one of these steps is roughly a day. So now we're four days into getting to a finished product. Once it goes into that finishing lab, we then separate any of the lipids, fats, or waxes from the crude oil. That would be a byproduct that I'm sure that they would want reporting on. And then we distill, we distill the remaining cannabinoids into a, a high-grade distillate, um, and they'd want to report on that. The problem that I see with this is, A, that's very cumbersome. Um, and these, these figures are going to vary daily based upon input. But it, it states in this rules and regs situation that if there's ever an inventory discrepancy, they have the right to come in and search my entire facility, including my persons and my person's personal vehicles. I don't know if there's in, anybody in the state other than myself or Colby or maybe one of the other processors that could tell you exactly how much you're supposed to yield on a, on a hemp input biomass into kilograms of crude or distillate. How, how is anybody going to know if there's an inventory discrepancy or not? Thank you. All right, then. Uh... Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, Senator Alley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Heath, I am very, um, I don't know a lot about your process. Let's put it that way. What product other than the oil do you produce? Pri primarily, we produce um, high-grade CBD oil and concentrate. The, the secondary products that we would have or, or intermediate products would be um, the spent biomass or the post-extracted hemp. And um, then there is also going to be a um, lipid waste. Um, essentially, think of it as hemp vegetable oil that we have to remove. Um, and then there's also going to be a post-distilled brood. Now, all of those that I spoke of are free of major cannabinoids, free of THC. Um, but those would be waste products that have essentially no value yet um, that they would want uh, want to keep tally on. And uh, I remember when this bill was being debated uh, on the floor to allow hemp to be grown and processed in Kansas that they were talking about uh, all the products that could be made out of hemp, paper and composites and all this stuff. Do we do any of that today? Um, yes, yeah, so we are working with um, uh, a graduate student at Stanford right now, um, working on some composites, textiles, things like that. Um, we're working with uh, actually a couple manufacturers here in the city um, to make um, airplane panel parts, um, uh, composites, acrylics, and things like that. Um, we're, we're getting closer. We're, we're getting much closer. Um, one of the things that's that's crazy being from Kansas in such a highly agricultural state, um, I'm a CO2 processor. So that means that my, my hemp biomass does not ever touch any harsh solvents. It essentially gets ground and um, liquid CO2 is forced through it and it extracts the oil. Once that's done, I have a massive amount of what, what could be basically deemed hemp sawdust. It's free of THC, it's free of CBD. We've run feed analysis on this, on this byproduct as well, which would be a phenomenal market for us. It actually has a greater feed value than dairy alfalfa, but based upon the USDA and some things, we're not actually even able to sell it. It's, it's illegal to sell to commercial animals. so. That's another one that needs to change, but absolutely there are there are things that can uh, be done with the byproducts. We just we need the freedom to explore that. Uh, so and maybe I'm maybe I'm not understanding everything, but from what you just said is yeah that you do have the possibility of of uh, uh, things that can be made, things can be produced off of this this uh, hemp byproduct, if you call that. The oil that uh, we're talking about that has a THC in it that you can't sell outside in Kansas, you got to you can't transport it outside. Uh, is that really where the where the dollars are? Is that yeah. what, what? And yeah, you're not absolutely. able to make you're not able to to 
to, to move that product today. Is that correct? Correct. Well, not, not under these proposed rules and regulations. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Any other questions, committee? Senator Francisco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for um, sharing this information with us. I think it's very um, helpful. Can you say a little more about, I think it's devitalizing the seeds and what the opportunity for seeds are, or what are we asking in terms of recording that um, information? Yeah, so in these rules and regs, they, they ask us on any of the hemp that we, that we take into our facility, that we must devitalize the seeds um, within 10 days of receipt into our facility. Hemp seeds have absolutely no THC in them. They have absolutely no CBD in them. What they do have is a ton of protein and omega fatty acids. The reason I think that they're asking us to devitalize these seeds is because this to me looks like a pseudo marijuana bill that we're trying, or a pseudo marijuana set of rules and regulations that we're trying to fit into hemp. I can understand that on marijuana, you wouldn't want the seeds getting out and having people take them and grow their own marijuana plants. But hemp seed is something that, just like I spoke to a minute ago, we could sell, we could resell. It's a foodstuffs. You, you buy whole hemp seeds at, at Whole Foods right now. And, and they want us in 10 days to, to grind them, crush them. It's, I don't understand it. Francisco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so the other thing I'm interested in, um, you sound like a good business person. So I'm guessing you are interested in keeping records um, of what's happening. So yeah. what are the records that you keep that would be um, then easy for you to share with um, inspectors? Yeah. So. The, the way that I would suggest doing this is the, is the way that we are currently doing it um, kind of matches the KDAs. We, we do everything on batch control. So what, what I would propose doing is that when said grower brings their biomass to me, we take an input weight. We know exactly what that weight is. We then take obvious data from extraction. We know exactly what we've extracted from that. We take all the data from distillation um, or post-processing. So we have all of those figures. So to me, let's not do this on a daily basis. Why don't we do it on a per batch basis? And so if farmer A has brought his biomass to me, once I'm done <coughs> processing it, I send all that data to the, the state fire marshal. He knows exactly what came of it. Thank you. Senator Straub. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Heath, for all of your information. Um, so if Kansas isn't able to um, sell the byproduct, the oil, what other states around us or how many other states do we have that, that are able to uh, transport the product or, or process the product without such strict regulation? Uh, most of the ones that are contiguous to us. Uh, and, and a whole host of, of more, um, you know, Colorado for sure, Oklahoma, Missouri. You don't even have to have a processor's license in Missouri to handle any of this. Um, but Kentucky, California, I mean, there may be forms um, that you should fill out and keep on file or submit, but there's, there's definitely not oversight like this. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. And a, fo a follow-up. Um, so hemp seeds in other states are not, you don't have to devitalize the seeds in other states either? No. Or do you know? No. I, I, I don't believe so. Um, I, I don't think that until this rule was proposed, we had to devitalize them in Kansas. Actually, I know we didn't have to devitalize them in Kansas. Um, there's a large processing group out of Great Bend. Um, they're doing seed and fiber processing. If they label themselves a processor, they're going to have to devitalize the seeds, the very thing that they are trying to process and take to market under these rules and regs. Thank you. I'm familiar with them. So uh, that Good. helps clarify some of that too. Um, I'm, I'm still a little green on the issue, but, uh, and I have another one more question, if you, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
So I know you can make a lot of other products. Um, my background's in textiles, and I understand that the fiber is really not the valuable part of the plant, but is very useful. Um, and even the, like you said, the, the other byproduct, like your, your leftover hemp uh, sawdust that could be used for animal feed. I know there's lots of products that come in from other countries um, you know, that have absolutely no THC, correct, that is used in animal food. How, how do we allow things to be imported from other countries but not allow a product that's grown right here to be sold as, as an animal or pet food? Uh, that's that's an excellent question. <laughs> I, I I don't know. Um, the the relative feed value on this is greater than most of the things that we're actually feeding currently. Um, I I think everybody needs to uh, let the uh, let the THC dog lie. We're we're so afraid of that, and it is in such minimal quantities. I understand. Nobody wants to see anybody breaking the law. Nobody wants to see anybody get hurt because of this. That's, that's not what we're about. Um, but I mean, frankly, last week we let somebody go and purchase a margarita to drive through. And, and you're concerned about me processing hemp as an agricultural commodity. Uh, sorry, guys, I'm, I'm just frustrated. I, I've got to fight for my business and I've got to fight for my, my employees. Oh, thank you. We understand your situation there it is a predicament that we're sitting here trying to figure out a way to dispose of a byproduct is it our task for the, our department and we got a product that we can't even sell because the cost is too prohibitive so uh, anyway that's part of our what we're confronted here with so anybody else have any questions uh, senator fag uh, thank you <clears throat> thank you mr chairman <clears throat> heath i was wondering you're a proponent on this exactly why are you in favor of this bill I'm in favor of the bill because we have to have a bill. We have to have something that makes this legal. Um, I'm not in favor of, of most of the rules and regulations, but when we're doing business as a hemp processor, there are, there are obviously people that we do business with as well that, that mandate that we have a license. I'm, I'm looking at this and knowing I have to have a license very soon or my bank accounts are going to get closed. My insurance company is going to drop me because we let the license lapse on 131 from the KDA and I don't have a license yet. Now, Mr. Jorgensen has been good about sending letters, letting people know that we're working on it. But Bank of the West corporate, frankly, doesn't care that they've got a letter. I have to have an actual license from the state of Kansas. So, I need something to get past. We want something to get past. We're all for moving this forward, but it's got to make sense. Okay. Any other final questions? Well, thank you very much, Heath. We, Can you hear me? We have. This we hear Senator, some. Senator McGinn. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. Um, Senator, so, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to say I thought the last two presenters uh, did an excellent job. I've learned way more about this whole hemp processing than than I ever have ab about making it finally economically viable. And that's when we started this whole conversation a few years ago. So I hope somehow, some way, we can continue the conversation of the points that we have heard today. And I know it's not in this bill, but there may be another bill that needs to eventually be created to address some of these problems. So I don't know if that means a study group or what, but um, I just wanna thank uh, the last couple conferees. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Ware. Thank you so much, you know, and, and to uh, Senator McGinn's point, I understand there is a meeting. Uh, Kelly, did you bring that up uh, tomorrow? Is that right, Kenny, with uh, ag folks and a, a lot of the major players in this whole issue? Uh, it would be lovely to know what comes out of that meeting. Is there a way that we could ask them to give us a report on what, they're, what they came to in that meeting or something like that? To this committee or what are you talking about? Yeah. I, I think this committee probably ought to hear it. Okay. 
Yeah, that we could make a day for that if, if there's time. So we got some business to do yet next week, so but uh, we can talk about that. Uh, we and for the time being, we got. I need to ask for. Are there any other? I would draw your attention to there. Are one more written proponent, Steve McGarr from High Plains Nutrition. He is his written only. And then I would ask, are there anybody else that wants to testify as a proponent? I'm uh, actually on the video conference. This is Steve McGarra. Oh, there you go. I have written only on my agenda here. So uh, we weren't sure if I was going to be able to make it in and uh, whether it would be appropriate, uh, but I did make it. And so I'd like to give a uh, verbal testimony in addition to that written testimony, if I could. Did you turn in written testimony too? Uh, I've, I've been working with Kelly Ripple, and I believe is okay. Uh, okay, we got it. Right we got it. We've got the testimony. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, senators and ladies and gentlemen, uh, and other participants. First, I do want to thank Heath for his uh, very thorough analysis. <clears throat> uh, let me tell you a little bit about High Plains Nutrition. We are specifically a nutrition ingredients company focused on human and animal feeds. So. I have partners in Kansas, Missouri, and three other states. Um, we are experts in the animal feed issue, so I can address some of those questions that were brought up. <clears throat> we're uh, working with Department of Commerce and Department of Ag in Kansas uh, to potentially build a large scale, high throughput feed ingredients processing facility in Kansas. Um, and that we're talking about throughputs of 80 to 100 tons a day of seed. Um, that's a continuous flow process. And because there's a significant amount of safety testing that must be done in every stage, uh, the 10 day limit on revitalization can be problematic. Let me give you an example. Uh, we're talking about multiple truckloads a day coming into our facility. Each of those has to be sequestered it has to go through certain laboratory analysis before we will even put it into the pipeline. In other words, we cannot allow contaminant to enter the processing pipeline at all. That includes the crusher, which does the devitalization. Now, some of that testing we can do in-house. Some of it is best to send out to third-party labs. Um, even on a best case scenario uh, with FedEx overnight, we're talking minimum three to five days turnaround. And that's assuming there's no backlog and that there's uh, no retesting required because obviously we do not want to throw away $50,000 worth of seed in a particular lot uh, simply because we need to do a retest and the 10 day time period expired. So if we're forced to deal with the 10 day law, we will in some cases simply be forced to uh, devitalize and either throw away or send to a biofuel producer or something the value of the, of the product essentially falls to zero and the costs uh, aren't even covered if we have to lose product in that sense. Um, so as far as that goes, we have been working with the FDA and the Association of Animal Feed Control Officials, that's AFCO. Uh, those are the two entities that's, that regulate, and, and particularly the FDA, any ingredients that go, go both into human food and animal foods. Uh, the questions about animal feeds <clears throat> really have to be addressed in the following way. Every animal is a unique species and the toxicology work and the feeding trials and the testing and the proof of safety and efficacy is on a per species per ingredient process. So what's an ingredient? Well, crushed seed oil is one ingredient. Uh, seed cake and protein powders, those are two separate ingredients biomass uh, leftover like Heath was talking about, that's a different ingredient altogether. So you can imagine uh, the complexity of the process and the expertise that it requires to get animal feed moving forward. We're deep into that. We've been doing it for four years now, and we're very close to getting the first uh, couple of animals approved with hemp products. However, on the scale... Steve, Steve, yes, Steve, sir. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but we have uh, only one more uh, person to testify today, and that's on the opponent's side. So I need to interrupt you and, and let him give his chance to talk about this on, as, with a little bit of time that we have left yet. So I appreciate your comments, but I want to give the 
opponent side with some time too yet. So that's a few minutes. Absolutely. I appreciate that. I do want to say that I do propose regulation because we need to have good rules of the road to operate in. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Thank you, Senators. Uh, um, committee, next we'll have, uh, uh, we have one opponent on virtual and that's Nick Reinecker, private citizen. Nick, are you on board? Mr. Chairman, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you real good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, members. Welcome to the committee. Welcome to the committee. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate uh, being allowed to speak. My name is Nick Reinecker uh, from Inman, Kansas, uh, and in my opinion, I, I'm an opponent to this uh, bill because uh, when I speak about it, uh, cannabis, I do not speak about the drug, the crop, or anything like that. I speak about the plant, and in my opinion until this plant, the cannabis plant is descheduled, uh, low THC cannabis or any type of cannabis is not gonna be economically viable uh, in the state of Kansas. Um, I would like to turn the, to the, uh, my testimony if I could, and I don't know if I can share it on the screen here, maybe. I believe we have, we have, a, we have, we have a written, your testimony. Okay. But you turned. Sorry. Um, on the public policy part of it, um, I'm doing something here on my computer. I apologize. Um, okay. On the regular, never mind. On, there's a public policy part there that, that reads uh, some stuff. And um, with bills like this, it seems like the legislative intent is more punitive and restrictive. Uh, and instead of having actors exploiting the hemp program, I'm worried about the bad actors exploiting our constitutional republic through the continued policy of outlawing natural occurring substances and then monopolizing or controlling the capitalistic qualities of synthetic products that are not included in an international treaty. The narrative has been strong too, because for so long now we've been told that this is two different plants. And in fact, yesterday, the state fire marshal mentioned hemp with TH 10% THC in it. Well, you know what the state of Kansas defines that as that's called marijuana. Uh, and, you know, yesterday it was mentioned that the, somebody had a potato and a six pack of beer. We don't call that a high starch content tuber and recreational alcohol. It's just what it is. And so as we go along here, I, I looked at these um, regulations that are based on current uh, state controlled substance act laws. And a lot of them, as I'm reading down there, I would not want to get involved with the low THC cannabis program at all. And I'm sitting here looking outside at my uh, garden area that I've yet to do anything with, thinking about, you know, just, simple freedoms and, and, and being able to grow and use uh, plants, uh, you know, at, at free will and, and how the government is, is doing this whole thing. And as you know, uh, committee, I've been doing this for eight years and I can list off one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 bills uh, in the last eight years that I've testified on regarding cannabis, hemp, low THC, high THC, all this stuff. And the main people are coming and saying that they don't want it is law enforcement. You guys are the legislature. You make the laws and they are supposed to enforce it, not the other way around. And so, you, you, you know, I could go on for hours and hours, but I want to respect the time of the committee. I want to respect the process and everything. But just know uh, that these other proponents out there looking like Oliver Twist saying, please, sir, can I have some more should not be. And so uh, as we go along, just please think about these things and, and make some good sound policy when it comes to cannabis in the state of Kansas, please. Thank you and I'll stand for any questions. Any questions? Not seeing any, uh, that's no, no other questions. That is all then. Thank you for your, your information. Are there, is there anyone else who wants to uh, testify as an opponent? Not seeing any, we'll, we will close the hearing on House Bill 2244. And um, committee, I had planned on uh, working uh, House Bill 2203. That, what that is, is um, the remediation fund for asbestos, which we did already. 
but we don't have the time for that today, so we'll postpone that for next week. Also, um, we're not meeting tomorrow, but uh, we'll, we'll, if we want to take up some more information on, on this, um, on 2244, maybe this weekend you can get some extra information and we can come to something, kind of a meeting next week. But uh, it's too important and there's too much information here to just push it aside. So we want to take it up and, and have a good discussion on it. And, and we want something that will work under all these conditions. So uh, that's the task that's at hand. And hopefully we'll see what turns out next day. We will not meet on Monday, but we will meet on Tuesday to take up House Bill 2203. We're waiting for the House to do Senate Bill 38 so we can go forward with that anyway. So that will be the plan. We will meet next week and then uh, we'll take care of 2203 on Tuesday and then uh, we'll see what progresses as far as the rest of the week and as far as this committee. So thank you for coming and thank you for your information. Appreciate it very much. We're adjourned. <laughs>